Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for this Talks at Google virtual event. My name is Jessica DeVento, and I'm the head of mental health at YouTube. And uh, before we get started, I want to remind the audience that we will be taking questions at the end. So um, please think of questions now and get ready to ask them, and then you can add them to the live chat on the right. So I am very excited to introduce to you Dr. Kristen Neff an expert in self-compassion. She is a leader in research on the impact of self-compassion on mental health and well-being. And much of society teaches us that self-compassion is the enemy of productivity uh, and that to be kind to ourselves is to invite complacency. But Dr. Neff says the opposite is true. She is a pioneer in the field of inner strength training and self-compassion and the first person to empirically study the concepts and create a simple, actionable guide proven to increase motivation boost resilience, and improve mental health. Her first book, Self-Compassion, The Proven Power of Being Kind to Yourself, was described by Brene Brown as a transformative read. It's a great sales pitch. Its companion, The Mindful Self-Compassion Workbook, went on to become a bestseller, proving, providing science-backed step-by-step guidance for tapping your inner resources and transforming the way you work and live. Dr. Neff is also an insight meditation practitioner and associate professor of educational psychology at the University of Texas at Austin, the co-developer of an empirically supported training program called Mindful Self-Compassion and co-founder of the nonprofit Center for Mindful Self-Compassion. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, The Atlantic, Harvard Business Review and others. And she has a TEDx talk that has been viewed over 1.7 million times. Today, she'll share with us the science behind self-compassion and will provide tangible strategies for practicing self-compassion, which can be especially helpful during times of change. Dr. Neff, it is my pleasure to welcome you to Talks at Google. Hi, Jessica. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so happy that you invited me on to speak with you all. Thank you. Yes, I'm very excited you're here. I'm a huge fan of your work. So I'm having a little fangirl moment myself. Very <laughs> um, so we, we have a series of questions for you before we dive into Q&A. So I will jump right in. Okay. So first, for folks who are not familiar with the concept of self-compassion, can you define it for us? Yeah, so the easy way to think about self-compassion is just turning compassion inward. In other words, treating yourself with the same warmth, kindness, concern, support when you're struggling uh, that you would naturally show to a friend that you cared about. So that's the easy way to think about what self-compassion is. Um, in the scientific study of self-compassion, it's a little more complex, my model. So there's the kindness, but we also need mindfulness. A lot of people have heard about mindfulness, which is really the ability to be present with what is happening as it's happening. And often when that, when that what's happening is a, a negative thought about ourselves or um, a, a very difficult circumstance, some sort of emotional suffering, it's hard for us to be present with it. Either we do one of two things, either we ignore it and avoid it, or we get lost in it so there's no perspective. So in order to be kind to ourselves, we need to like step outside of ourselves and say, hey, you're having a hard time. So we need some mindful perspective on our emotions. And then really importantly, compassion is not, pity, it's not poor me, it's a connected stance. In other words, you know, what makes it compassion as opposed to pity is, hey, I've been there as opposed to poor you or poor me. So with compassion, we recognize that, you know, the human experience is imperfect. We make mistakes, that's, that's the plan we signed up for, things happen. I'm not alone in my struggles. And that connected stance actually helps us, um, one of the, it's one of the factors of resilience that we don't feel so all alone in our emotional challenges. I love that. And I really appreciate your um, talking about perspective taking and stepping outside of ourselves with mindfulness, but also thinking of like how we would talk to a good friend. It's so simple if we can take that moment and that space to do that before we react uh, to ourselves, it sounds like. Yeah, it, it, it's simple. It's not natural. I'm going to admit yeah. it. <laughs> it's, uh, in, in, and I mean that not just the two, uh, I mean, facetiously, but so evolutionarily, when we feel threatened in some way, our natural instinct is to go into fight, flight, or freeze response, right? So we, we fight ourselves, we criticize ourselves, thinking somehow that's going to keep us in line or make us make changes that, so that we'll be safe, or we flee into shame and isolation, or we freeze and get stuck. Um, 
So it's natural to beat ourselves up, you might say, when we feel threatened. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. it's not very effective. It's really good for running away from saber toothed tigers, but not good for dealing with like, you know, I don't like the way I look in this dress. It's really not very helpful in that circumstance. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing with self-compassion is we're tapping into another safety system, which is the care system that actually evolved to care for others. It's the system that evolved to care for our children, that kind of warmth, soothing, support system, or with other group members who we're close to. And this is another way we feel safe, but typically we give that sense of care and soothing and comfort to other people. So we're doing a little hack, actually. <laughs> we're tapping into the care system, which was evolutionarily designed for others, and we're using it for ourselves. And the great thing is our brain doesn't really know the difference. So if we treat ourselves like we treat a friend, we still feel like we're, we're getting that support that we will get from a friend. And that's one of the reasons it's so powerful. But don't beat yourself up if you don't do it naturally because evolution didn't really design it this way. We're doing a little hack around it. And then it would be ironic to beat ourselves up for not being self-compassionate. So we can ironic, use self-compassion about very common. struggling with self-compassion. Believe me, common, yeah. <laughs> so I'm super curious, what got you into researching self-compassion? Well, for me, it, it actually started as a personal practice. So I learned mm -hmm. about it in my last year of graduate school. I was going to UC Berkeley doing my PhD. Um, and I was, I was a mess, if I'm totally honest. I was under mm -hmm. a lot of stress. Would I get a job after spending six years of my life for this PhD? Um, I was, I'd also gotten out of a divorce and I was feeling a lot of shame and self-doubt and insecurity. And so I started learning mindfulness meditation and the woman leading the mindfulness group really talked about the importance of turning the, the lens of compassion inward as well as outward. So, so I started being kinder and more supportive to myself. And I was just completely blown away by the difference it made in my life. And then I did get a job. My first job was doing um, two years of postdoctoral study with one of the country's leading self-esteem researchers. And it was while I was working with her that I started becoming familiar with all the, the problems with self-esteem. There's, there's nothing wrong with self-esteem itself. So self-esteem means judging yourself to be worthy. It's better to think you're worthy than not worthy. The problem is the judging bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so self-esteem is, is contingent, right? We have to feel special and above average. We have to achieve our goals. We have to succeed rather than fail. We have to feel people like us in order to have self-esteem. And because of that self-esteem, the, the pursuit of it, can lead to some nasty things like bullying or narcissism or instability, like our self-esteem bounces up and down depending on what's happened to us lately. And I realized while doing my postdoc that self-compassion was this stable sense of self-worth. You know, it didn't depend on getting it right. It didn't depend on being better than anyone else. It just depended on being a flawed human being. Well, I, and I was realizing personally, I can check that box every time. And so I, I thought when I got my I got a, my real job at UT Austin, I thought this is really a powerful alternative to self-esteem. No one's really researched it before. And so I kind of t I made, made a stab at it. I created a scale, scale to measure self-compassion. I developed a theoretical model. I started doing research. And now there are over, over 4,000 studies looking at self-compassion. So wow. clearly this is something whose time was, was ready to be investigated. Yeah. It's quite That's exciting. awesome. Yeah. And, and you mentioned uh, a divorce and coincidentally, I found your work when I was going through divorce myself and it really helped me lean into mindful self-compassion during that time, as well as leaning into uh, Lizzo's music. <laughs> that really helped right. get me through. Um, yeah. So I, well, I it's thank you so for important. that as well. Anytime, anytime we suffer, it's so important. It helps so much. Yeah. So what were the most interesting findings to you that came out of, as you said, 4,000 research studies so far? Yeah, I didn't do all 4,000. I've done like 100. <laughs> That's a lot. I can't even, if there's two or three new studies every day, I can't even keep up, keep up with it. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of interesting findings. Well, one, one that kind of surprised me, and although it makes sense, is I kind of expected that higher levels of self-compassion would be linked to um, less depression, less anxiety and stress. Because if you think about it, what, what compassion is? Passion in the Latin means to suffer, calm means with. So it's a way of being with ourselves as we suffer. So with support, with kindness, a sense of not being so alone, with mindfulness. 
And so uh, when we do that, it means we're less likely to get overwhelmed by our negative emotions. Mm -hmm. And it's when we're overwhelmed that we, that we shut down in depression or we get overwhelmed with anxiety or we, we freeze and get stuck. Or you might even think of suicidal ideation as the ultimate resort to escape our pain if we really just can't handle it. It's too much. So I, I kind of expected that. But what I was surprised by is self-compassion is equally linked to positive states of mind. Things like hope, things like happiness, things like life satisfaction. And that's because even though it's how we relate to suffering, it feels good to be kind to ourselves. It feels good to be connected to something larger than ourselves. It feels good to be present. And so it has this real alchemical quality of transforming something negative into something actually quite positive. There's, it, it feels good to be compassionate, even if what you're being compassionate about is quite difficult. That's amazing. I love that it has uh, kind of both sides there and that um, it's important to give space to both the, the difficult times, but also the positive as well. Um, right. So I know a lot of our listeners are super curious about this. How does somebody know if they're self-compassionate or not? Well, it's actually really easy. Well, there's two easy ways. <laughs> the easiest way is probably to go to my website, selfcompassion.org. <laughs> you can take the scale, print out a score for you. But an even simpler way to do it is just um, write down uh, what the types of things you say to yourself when you've made a mistake or um, you know something is you failed at something or you're, you're facing a difficult situation. Just write down what the type of thing you say to yourself and also the tone you use with yourself. And then ask yourself, is this the way I speak to a friend? Right? And most people are actually really shocked to see how much kinder and more supportive they are to friends than they are to themselves. And you can ask yourself, would I say this to a friend? <laughs> and if you wouldn't, then you're probably not very self-compassionate. Mm. Why do you think that, so I was just gonna say, in some ways it's very intuitive because we already know, like mindfulness is a little abstract, but compassion mm -hmm. we know, most of us have had the experience of being compassionate to someone else. We know what it looks like, we know what it feels like. And so you can use that as a template to say, yeah, am I being this way with myself? What would it look like if I were to treat myself like a friend? Yeah, I imagine, like you saying, it's, I don't know, at least for me, it's easy to wrap my head around, but I know difficult to practice like in the moment as the critical thoughts are happening. So for those of us, I know for myself, I can be hard on myself from time to time. And, um, and I know a lot of people who are in the same boat. If we do happen to be more self-critical, how do we start to yeah. steer that ship and shift, shift over into being more self-compassionate? Right. So first of all, it's important to understand why we're self-critical. Ironically, it comes from a helpful place. We think that, you know, we're, we're doing something that's harming us in some way, or we aren't achieving our goals, or we're, we're unsafe in some way. And we really, part of us thinks that by beating ourselves up or by holding ourselves to these really high, st tough standards, that it's gonna get us into shape or it's gonna help us make a change. It's, it's almost like, you know, some parents are this way. Some parents are really harshly critical to their children in the misguided notion that that's actually gonna help their child mm -hmm. achieve their goals. And what we know about that is it, it kind of works in the short term in the sense that you'll get compliance, you'll get it with the kid and you'll get it with yourself. If you just really, really slam yourself with criticism, you might just to avoid the pain of it, you might get something done. But just as with the child that has all sorts of negative consequences, first of all, shame depletes your energy. It's not exactly a motivating mindset. It undermines your self-confidence. It gives you performance anxiety. It creates fear of failure. It's hard to learn from any experience because you're so overwhelmed with the shame. And the same thing happens with ourselves. So, but we don't know this. See, so if you think of the fight, flight, or freeze response, it's kind of our reptilian brain. It's a very old response. It's the only, that part of us, it's the only thing it knows. It's the only way it knows how to help us. Mm -hmm. So we can say to our inner critic, um, you know, thank you for trying to help me. I appreciate your efforts, but actually I'm going to try the encouraging approach, like, like, you know, Ted Lasso, think Ted Lasso or some sort of really ultimately kind, encouraging, positive figure you might still call you to task and say, Hey, this isn't working. You need to change something, but coming from a place of care, not from a place of feeling that you're inadequate. So it's not about not changing or not allowing that space for change. It's about the how we approach that change process. 
Exactly. And actually, in my recent work, I've been talking about two sides of self-compassion, tender self-compassion and fierce self-compassion, because, because people get confused about this. It is true, in some ways, self-compassion is about tender acceptance. We accept ourselves, flaws and all, we're there for ourselves, we soothe ourselves. It's kind of a, a nurturing energy, like mothering or, re, or fathering, reparenting ourselves. But it's also like fierce mama bear. You know, it's, it's like, hey, this behavior is harming you, or this situation is harming you. You need to speak up or draw a boundary or do something different or motivate a change. But so in other words, we are okay, but our behaviors maybe could use a little work. And so a lot of the situations, especially if they're unjust or really harmful, we don't wanna just accept those. So it's about accepting ourselves and yet changing what we can change in terms of our behaviors and our situation to be happy and well. And how do you know uh, the discernment to lean into more of that that fierce place or that tender place? Yeah, and, so, and ultimately we actually want to integrate them. It's like yin and yang, mm -hmm. we want mm -hmm. both. So if, if we're too fierce without enough tenderness, we may get aggressive or just you know too um, competitive, for instance, or really striving to get things, to change things. On the other hand, if we're too accepting, we might be too complacent. So we always need both energies. But a really easy way to practice, well, I say easy, but the practice of self-compassion is basically, what do I need right now? Just pausing to ask yourself that question is often radical. You know, we're so caught up in our day and just getting going through the motions and I need to do this and this and this and this. How often do we pause to say, what do I really need right now or in this situation? And you may not know, you know, so you may trial and error, try this, and I need a little more of that, and you go a little left, and I need to go a little more right. But the, the basic thing is that you care, and you're trying to support yourself as best you can. And it's the intention that really makes all the difference. When you feel you have your own back and your own support, it goes a long way toward um, really helping you feel secure enough and safe enough to achieve what you want to achieve in life. That's great. Um, so, one reason I would first started digging into your work, I used to oversee employee mental health. And so we were digging in yeah. for employees. And uh, I'm curious your perspective of why companies or large organizations should care about self-compassion. Yeah, so there's been quite a few articles now in Harvard Business Review. It took a little while for uh, that world to catch to get on board, but I think it's happening now, partly because of the research, right? The research OS leads. And so what we know is, first of all, it's, it's very good for motivation. It's, it's, it's a more effective motivator than self-criticism. And so it increases worker productivity, for instance, right? Um, reduces things like fear of failure, um, increases learning goals. So, you know, when you think about it in the workplace, how do we learn and improve? Well, we have to fail, right? Didn't Thomas Edison mm -hmm. say something like, you know, it took me 10,000 failures before I got it right. So we know we learn from failure, but if we're afraid to try because we're afraid we might fail, how are we going to learn? So the research shows that it enhances motivation. It leads to a growth mindset, which is so important for success mm -hmm. in the workplace. Um, it reduces things like employee turnover. Again, because if you're, if you're more able to deal with the emotional ups and downs of work, um, then you're less likely to burn out from work. There's also research showing that it reduces burnout because again, you can cope with the difficulties moment by moment as they arise. Um, there was also a study that showed um, it increased employee satisfaction, right? So a commitment to the workplace. And there was one more finding, what was it? Um, Oh, I forget, but, but basically it's, it's really good for work plus, oh, I know, I know what I want to say, leaders. It's good for leadership. They did a study that found that leaders who displayed self-compassion, especially in a kind of obvious way in terms of what they say out loud to their employees, that employees respect a leader more who's self-compassionate. So mm -hmm. instead of just saying like, oh, I've got it all together, or instead of saying, oh, I'm such a doofus, right? A leader, you can actually say, hey, I failed. Well, that's okay. What can we learn from this? That employees really respect and look up to leaders like that. So it's also good for in that context. I love that. And um, I don't even, I was started to count how many things you're speaking of there. And then I lost count. There's so yeah. many things that it contributes to in a workplace environment. Oh, I know. One more, work-life balance. Yeah. That's another thing, work-life balance, which, uh, which is related to the lack of burnout because 
and maybe some employers wouldn't like this. I, I think you two probably would because they're progressive, but you know, not saying yes to everything and saying, hey, I, I would love to say yes, but you know, my, my cup is full. I need to set some limits here so I can continue to do my job without losing myself in the process, which ultimately is good for everyone because you, if you aren't burnt out, you can continue to work productively. That's right. Yes. And we do like to think about investing in our employees for the long term. So absolutely yes. aligned yeah. with that. And I'm hearing <laughs> you speak about things both kind of on the individual level, but also on the systemic level, which is really great because it really takes both. Yeah. 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 So we just did a great uh, study. We developed a program for healthcare workers and we called it self-compassion for healthcare communities. When we first developed the program, we thought it was just to help our stressed out healthcare workers survive all the craziness of their life. And we taught them practices that could be done on the job, as they're working, no extra time. But we slowly realized it wasn't just impacting the individuals, it was impacting the whole culture. We, we, we developed it at a children's hospital. And what started happening is nurses and doctors were practicing self-compassion and talking about it to other people. And the culture started to shift from one of self-sacrifice, like how many straight shifts in a row did you go without sleep? Mm. One of self-compassion, like, hey, take a break or make sure you're asking yourself what you need right now. And it started to change the culture. And then the parents whose children were at the children's hospital wanted training. And it really was, it was like this wildfire fire that spread throughout the hospital system. It was really wonderful. And they continued to teach courses there. So it's contagious. And there's actually research that shows that if you model self-compassion out loud, other people think, yeah, that makes sense. That's a good way to talk to myself. And so you can actually help others by helping yourself. The story about the children's hospital is so beautiful because it just seeing it spread throughout and seeing all the different various folks practice it and um, yeah. the culture shift can be so hard. So it's amazing that it, it had such a, an amazing impact at that at that hospital. Yeah. Well, the nice, I, I like to say self-compassion sells itself, not that it needs to be sold, but it's, it just, first of all, it makes sense and it works. You, you know, in some ways you don't even have to be convinced of it. It's like, it's just that we haven't been taught this. Once you think about it, if you just ask yourself the simple question, would I say this to a friend? And what would be the effect if I did say this to a friend? Then you can just understand, well, that's going to have the same effect on yourself. So it's really a, um, a very intuitive idea. It's just one we aren't used to. And I would, I would say also evolutionarily, it's not completely natural, like you talked mm -hmm. about before, which is the other reason we don't necessarily do it. So I hear, I know we've talked about like, oh, it doesn't feel, you know, a natural process. It's not something folks normally lean into. Um, and then also, but the practices are easy, but might are difficult to put in practice, right? So, well, that, what... so that's actually not necessarily the case. You asked me one of the other things that surprised, well, I'll tell you one of the other things that surprised yeah. me about my research is it's easier than I thought it would be to teach people this skill. So at first it feels odd. Is, and so in, in other words, I don't want people to think there's something wrong with you because you aren't self-compassionate because our culture doesn't teach us that or our, our nervous system doesn't necessarily react that way. But because we have so much experience being compassionate to others, actually, once you figure it out, it's not, it's not very hard. It's not rocket science. And even people, I mean, people with really uh, early trauma histories, people who, who have some fear of self-compassion because you know, they've had to shut their heart down their whole lives to protect themselves. And it's kind of scary to open up. But I've been surprised, especially with some help. Anyone seems to be able to do this because it comes naturally to us. The ability to care also comes naturally to us. So just making that little shift, it's, it's more of a mental leap we have to make. But the biggest thing we have to give us is we have to give ourselves permission to be compassionate to ourselves. Mm -hmm. But once we give ourselves that permission, it's surprisingly easy. And I, I've been happily surprised that way. It's, it's much easier than I thought it would be. So that permission piece, is that one of the biggest barriers? Are there other barriers that you see? And how do you combat those? Yeah, so there are there are barriers. So, it, and I, like I said, there's a lot of myths about self-compassion that stand in the way. The number one myth is that it's gonna undermine our motivation. We really believe that self-criticism is the only way to get things done. Uh, so again, it kind of works, but not nearly as effectively as kindness, support, um, encouragement. Uh, another myth is that it's going to make us weak. You know, we think that compassion is only soft and kind of squishy. 
Well, if you think of fierce mama bear, you know, you want to see a force of nature, look at a mother bear whose children are threatened. And when we take that attitude toward ourselves and we really care when we're really invested, um, it gives you the strength to get through. Another example, um, combat soldiers. So it's being taught in the VA now, which is great. Combat great. soldiers who are self-compassionate about the combat they've experienced overseas um, are more, they're stronger. They're more able to get through it without developing post-traumatic stress syndrome. They're less likely to turn to drugs or alcohol or thoughts of suicide as a way to deal with what they've experienced. They're more able to function because again, when you're an ally, it's like, you know, it's like wartime when you're an ally and you have your own back, of course you're gonna be stronger than when you're shooting yourself down all the time. And that's the same with whether you're dealing with COVID, a lot of research on COVID showed that self-compassion helped people cope with COVID. Uh, raising special needs kids, going through divorce. I mean, basically you name it. If it's difficult, self-compassion gives you the strength and the ability to cope with it resiliently. So that's a block. Oh, and then there's one more I want to talk about, and that is that it's um, selfish. This, I must say this hits women especially hard because women are raised to always be self-sacrificing and always focus mm -hmm. on others first. And, you know, we're valued for focusing on others first, especially our children or family. And people, we think it's selfish. Well, it's almost as if we believe that we have a limited supply of compassion. So if I give three units to myself, I'm only gonna have two left over for someone else. And of course it doesn't work that way, it's additive. So the more compassion you let flow inward, the more you have available to flow outward and be able to give to others without depleting yourself or burning out. So again, um, People don't know this, however, and these fears, that, can you be too self-compassionate? You actually can't by definition <laughs> because compassion is concerned with the alleviation of suffering. And if you're doing something that causes suffering in the long term, it's not self-compassionate. That really resonates with me about um, it's not selfish, you know, as a working mom and feeling like, you know, having to do it all in the office, having to do it all in the household and, um, giving ourselves permission to be self-compassionate and it not being selfish and it being additive to our lives in a really robust way that can only help us move forward and contribute even more so to our children and our families and our, and our workplace at the same time. That's right. And especially, I mean, time is limited. It's true. We don't have unlimited time. So sometimes we need to make hard choices. You know, I, right. I, I'm, a, I'm a parent of an autistic child, so I understand sometimes you do have to sacrifice your time Right. But in terms of emotional support, in terms of warmth, in terms of care, that's unlimited. So really, the more we give ourselves, the more emotional resources we have for others. So even if we can't yeah. spend the time we'd like to, just because of reality, if you're kind to yourself, you know, I remember, you know, raising my son, um, if there were times when it was really difficult. He's doing great now, by the way, but when he was that's younger, great. it was a challenge. And there wasn't, a, I didn't have a lot of choice in terms of dealing with it in the moment or taking time for myself, but I gave myself kindness. You know, I, I really was there for myself. I validated my struggles. Um, I really thought about uh, any way I could do to help ease things for myself. I, I, you know, I gave myself a little pat on the back. You're doing the best you can, Kristen, things like that. And it really made a difference in my ability to cope with those early, difficult early years. That's great. Yeah. I like to say to myself, sometimes you're doing the best with the resources you have right now. And exactly. so <laughs> I just try to, and when, it, when a friend that. says that, I think it feels so nice. Like there's like, they, they are, they, and they see you, they see that you're trying They're they're, they're, they're on your side and we can actually give that to ourselves as well. And if it's okay to take a step back a bit, you were talking actually um, about veterans and about folks who have gone through you know, very difficult situations with lots of suffering and the yeah. world um, experiences so much trauma day to day, to day uh, yeah. this weekend included. And I just yes. wonder how, um, how folks can practice self-compassion to help them process and get through traumatic times. Yeah. So, um, because with the natural instinct, when things are so traumatic, like they've been recently, um, just, you just, you don't want to go there. Right. And by the way, I think sometimes we have to also respect that instinct, because if you have to function in your job, for instance, maybe you actually in that moment can't go there. But we also we don't want to isolate ourselves from the fact that we're, we want to be able to see what's happening 
so that we can try to hopefully change the world so that all these horrible things don't continue. So really taking the time to um, validate your empathic pain. So one of the features of being a human being is we are affected by the emotions of others. And so when others are suffering, we actually feel that. That's the way the human brain is designed. We have mirror neurons and everything that are designed to do that. And so part of the, part of the only ways, uh, one of the only ways we can take in that type of pain without being overwhelmed is by focusing inward, right? You can say something like, this is so hard for me right now. So in, in other words, instead of just railing against it and getting really frustrated by the fact that it's happened, you can just acknowledge how challenging it is for you in the moment to feel it. Um, feelings of grief, feelings of sorrow, feelings of confusion, just really just like, you know, you can say, to, sometimes I say to myself, it's kind of a, a little vulnerable, but I really do say this, I won't abandon you, Kristen, because there's this sense like, this is so scary. I, I've got your back. I won't abandon you. And then once you feel that, you can be with your emotions. You can actually open to more pain. And then you can kind of look up and go, wow, right? So um, the compassion has to flow inward as well as outward. I know it's cheesy, but it is like that airplane thing, put your own oxygen mask on before helping others. It's really mm -hmm. true because if we get so overwhelmed by others' pain or the pain of the world that we can't function, we aren't any good to anyone. You made a comment there and I want to make sure I get it right. Validating our empathic experience. Is that what you said? Our, our, our empathic pain. Yeah. Pain. Thank you. Validating our empathic. If you pain. see someone like get injured, the pain centers of your brain get activated. You know, not, not as intensely, of course, but you are actually feeling it. And especially if you're a sensitive person. Yeah. And so you've got a couple of choices. You either numb yourself out or you give yourself compassion so that you aren't so overwhelmed by it. So I imagine um, how you deal with traumatic situations is similar to how you deal with like lots of change. The world has been going through so much change with COVID and now employees kind of, for those yes. who had the privilege of working from home, you know, going back into the office in various yeah. ways. Um, how do we apply self-compassion in navigating times of transition? Yeah, just, just moment by moment. So self-compassion, there are self-compassion practices. I've developed a lot of them, but it's really a mindset. So in other words, every time something difficult comes up, a difficult thought, a difficult emotion, some sort of challenge, some fear, whatever it comes up, really just practice being supportive toward yourself. In other words, feeling, instead of feeling isolated, full of shame, like something's wrong with you for having this happen, just remembering this is part of the human experience, right? trying to be present as much as you can with what's happening. So that sense of support, you're there for yourself. And then kindness, you know, words of encouragement or warmth or understanding, really whatever you need to hear. Like you can be that person in your own ear, whispering to yourself what you ideally like to hear from others. And maybe you're lucky to have that friend or that partner or, or that family member who's there for you consistently. But they aren't there 24 seven the way you are. Right. So you can actually learn as you go through all these difficulties, just to have this friendly, benevolent mindset. And that means whatever happens, you know, it's not going to, it's not going to like make all your problems go away. It's not magic dust. It doesn't make the world suddenly right. The things are still going to be happening, but it's the way you relate to them. They aren't going to be as overwhelming. It will give you strength. And what starts to happen, this, I know this sounds weird, but I'm going to say it anyway. What starts happening, instead of, instead of being so focused on, you might say, the contents of awareness, the thoughts, the emotions, the situations, you learn to more and more identify with the, the quality of loving awareness that's aware of this, what's happening moment to moment. So instead of just that painful thought or that fear, you're also the sense of compassion and presence that's aware of that, that painful thought or fear. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Mm -hmm. So when you are so identified and sucked into the contents of awareness, and you have a little more spaciousness to be this kind, warm, uh, supportive presence to yourself, and you start to get your sense of happiness really from the awareness and the presence as opposed, you aren't so dependent on things going exactly as you would like them to go, uh, because good luck with that one. 
Yeah. Right. I know every and, day something's going to go off. You know, I imagine. It's, it's yeah. always going to go wrong, but, but your, your awareness, if, if, if you cultivate a compassionate, friendly, warm, caring presence in your own mind and heart, then that's really what's primarily going to affect your mood, your happiness, um, how you're able to get things done. So it's, it's just a matter of shifting from being so focused on trying to make things right and make things exactly as we want them to be and focusing more on opening our heart. Yeah, I imagine um, we're talking, you're talking about um, being like reliant on our support system, which is very important. And I understand it's very important to try to build a support system when, when yes. there's, you know, an ability to do so. But even our support systems will fall short sometimes um, and they should have permission to do so because they're also human and have limits and boundaries and such. And so having yeah. those internal reserves and that internal place to also give support, I imagine um, is incredibly important to help get us through those difficult times. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes people have good support, but they can't take it in because they're so hard on themselves mm -hmm. internally. They can't even hear the support mm -hmm. they're getting from others or take it in or give themselves permission to receive it. So it really does have to start with ourselves. Yeah. So final question before we shift gears a little bit, which is like, really what's next? Um, we've been going, you, we've been talking about your research and your, your, you know, we've mentioned your book at the beginning and your workbook at the beginning. And I know you lead workshops and you have your nonprofit. What's next yeah. for you next for your research? Right. So um, what I'm doing is I'm moving away from um, traditional academia and I'm focusing more on the teaching. And what's really exciting is the Center for Mindful Self-Compassion that I co-founded with Chris Germer. We're really starting to work on creating adaptations of self-compassion training for particular populations. Mm. So for instance, I talked about we created a training for the healthcare community. Their needs are different than other people who have more time. Um, there's, a, there's a program for couples, there's a program for teens, there's a program for parents. Um, my dissertation student just created a program for athletes and they loved it. Oh, wow. So really seeing, um, really tailoring self-compassion practices to meet the particular needs of particular groups of people. And personally, we, we aren't there yet, but I would love to see self-compassion um, brought in more explicitly into social justice work, anti-racism, you know, all, all the hard work we have yeah. facing us, um, global warming, the really tough stuff, really seeing how we can tailor self-compassion to be helpful with these particular types of suffering. That's really what's exciting for me. Well, I'm excited to hear about it. And I'm so glad that you're doing this work and that um, folks who are learning under you are also doing this work. And I look forward to seeing all those as they come out. So I know we have a special little treat for the audience before we move into Q&A. Dr. Neff has agreed to lead us through a self-compassion exercise. So I will pass yes. it to you. Thank you. Yes, this is called the self-compassion break. And basically what it is, is we intentionally call in the three components of self-compassion, so mindfulness, a sense of common humanity and kindness, and apply it toward a, a real instance of a challenge or stress or uh, distress that we're experiencing. So uh, I'm going to close my eyes for this practice. I encourage you to close your eyes because it helps to go inward. But if you're in a public place, you don't necessarily have to, but I'm going to. Okay. So just take a moment to settle into your body. With your feet on the floor, the weight of your body on your chair. Just coming back to the here and now. Okay, so I'd invite you to think of something that's happening in your life right now that is challenging in some way. This may be something personal. Maybe you're feeling badly about yourself for some reason. Or maybe you made a mistake or failed at something. Or maybe you're having a relationship issue or something's going on at work or a health problem. Okay, so something that's occurring that's challenging, but not overwhelming, because if you start thinking about it and you get overwhelmed, you actually won't be able to learn the practice. So something that's distressing, but not overwhelmingly so. So take a moment to choose wisely. Call the situation to mind. Mind what's happening. 
as you feel uncomfortable as you think about this, but not overwhelming. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is bring in mindful awareness, right? So really just acknowledging this is hard, right? It's, it's hard to feel this, it's hard to experience this. You know, this moment is, there's, there's suffering present. So any words that make sense to you that feel right to really acknowledge and validate the fact that you're having difficulty. And also remembering that, you know, it's not, you aren't the only one, right? This is part of being a human being. There's nothing wrong with you for having this happen or feeling this way. And you certainly aren't alone. And this is actually what connects you with other people, these types of challenges. And then we wanna bring in some kindness, some, some words of kindness, if you can, of support or encouragement or understanding about this situation. And if you aren't really sure what you might say to yourself, you can imagine, uh, what if I had a really good friend who was having the exact same experience I'm having? Right? What, would I, what would I say to that friend? And also, how would I say it? What would my tone of voice be? What would I express to my friend? And then make a U-turn and see if you can say something similar to yourself. Right, it may, may feel a little awkward. And just let it be so. It feels it does feel a little awkward at first. What we're really doing is changing our intention to be more supportive toward ourselves. And the practice eventually uh, bears fruit. Okay, you can open your eyes. So that's very simple. It's just bringing in intentionally these three elements of self-compassion, mindfulness, common humanity, and kindness. Um, and the research shows that when you do this, it really, you know, it changes your mood, it reduces depression, it reduces feelings of shame, it helps you be more motivated. It, it's simple, um, but quite powerful. Thank you so much for leading us through that. I especially enjoyed it. And I even reflected on something that I was struggling with at work, recently took on a new role, which is overwhelming for all the right reasons, uh, but it's hard. It's hard to take mm -hmm. on you know, a new role and do something different. And thinking through, I didn't realize how not self-compassionate I was being until I did the mm -hmm. exercise and realized, wow, I could really use some more of this through this process, which is good. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I feel a little bit better already. So thank you. Thank yourself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank myself. Yes. Um, so now we're going to shift into Q and A. I know we do have um, some audience questions. So first question from Avery uh, for you, Dr. Neff. Both you and Brene Brown have researched and shared tangible strategies to improve mental health and well-being. Can you share more on how you have worked together and how your work is interconnected? Uh, well, so Brene Brown has been, I have such gratitude to her. She's been a great supporter of me for many years. Um, and I did some uh, workshops with her. Um, so lately she's a little busy making all our Netflix specials. We haven't worked together as much lately. Um, but yeah, that, that's the main way um, we've, we've worked together is we've actually done a little bit of teaching together and she had me come in and do some of uh, teacher trainings for the people who are teaching her program. So that's yeah. awesome. Thank you. All right, next question. Um, I'm question from, I don't want to mispronounce the name, but I'm going to guess Sai uh, 
how to teach self-compassion to the kids. Is there any book you recommend to start with? Ooh, I'm very eager to know this one too. Yeah, so there are um, a few children's books out there. I can't think of the name right off my head, but if you go to my website, selfcompassion.org and go to the resources page, I have them listed. I think there's one called How to Tame the Tumbles by a dear friend, Eileen Beltzner. It's really quite good. Um, uh, shoot, I'm blanking on it right now, but there are a few good children's books. Basically, the way they come at it, the way you talk to this, um, to kids, is by about age seven, one of the main developmental tasks is learning about friendship. Right? By about age seven, they start kids start forming friendships and you start talking about what it means to be a good friend. And that's really the easiest way to access this for kids. You can actually say, but you remember, you also need to be a good friend to yourself. Well, what would that look like? And, you know, would you say that to a friend and things like that? It seems to be the easiest doorway in is the idea of being a good friend to yourself. That's great. I have a seven-year-old myself, so perfect oh, timing. Oh, yeah, yeah. I need to get perfect, in on the perfect timing. Floor. Yeah. I love it. All right, next question. From Kishan, who I know, I'm so glad Kishan put in a question. How is self-compassion related to our overall self-esteem and self-worth? Yes, it's a great question. So they are related and they're actually fairly strongly correlated, which means they tend to go together. But the difference is the self-worth that comes from self-compassion is more stable and less contingent than many other forms of self-esteem, self right? So there's this kind of the sense of unconditional self-worth that doesn't depend on how you look or how much people like you. Increases in self-compassion are linked to that type of self-worth. Some types of self-esteem, you may, you may think about yourself really highly, but it may be contingent on, you know, what happens when you fail, then you lose your self-esteem. So just to give an example, we did one study where we looked at, um, a state self-worth, which meant how are you feeling about yourself right now? And we had a global evaluation of self-esteem, how much you like yourself and your tendency to be self-compassionate. And we measured 12 times over eight months that sense of how are you feeling right now? And we found that it was self-compassion more than a global sense of self-esteem that predicted how stable your self-worth was. So they do go together and, and you know, and. And also it goes the other way. So if you have higher self-esteem, it's going to be easier to be self-compassionate. So they do interrelate, but self-compassion is more um, unconditional, whereas self-esteem, not always, but often is conditional. The, the other big difference is self-esteem is often linked to comparison with others and self-compassion isn't. You don't have to be better than anyone else to have self-compassion. So. Yeah, you mentioned that earlier as well, that self esteem is more contingent and self-compassion is not. Contingent. Yeah. I mean, so it's kind of it's self-worth. If you think of self-worth and then both are types of self-worth, self-esteem, if you think of esteem as a judgment that makes you worthy, it's a judgment that I'm attractive enough or I'm successful enough or that people like me enough, then the, the, the self-worth tends to be contingent. Um, but they're both forms of self-worth. But self, there's less judgment in self-compassion than there is in classic self-esteem, which is about esteeming yourself as worthy. And, of, <laughs> and I want to get the, the research right. Higher self-compassion was a better predictor of stable self-worth over the time. Stability of self-worth over time, right? So if you, if you take a, like a trait score, which means in general, how am I self-compassionate? Do I have high self-esteem? And the moment by moment, how are you feeling about yourself today? Self-compassion predicted more stability in that self-worth. With self-esteem, maybe one day you feel on top of the world, the next day you're in the pits because you made a mistake or something didn't come through. So That's great. That's helpful. Yeah. Thank you. All right, next question. Anna Maria, I'm curious if there's a gender or race lens to self-compassion. What have you found in your research? Great. So in terms of uh, racial differences, we haven't really found any, we've found some cultural differences, but for instance, like Taiwan and Thailand are on opposite ends of the spectrum. So it's more culture than race, at least from what we know. But we have found gender differences. Um, there's, a, there's a small but consistent difference. This surprises a lot of people in favor of men. So even though compassion is part of the female gender role, um, females are with a lot of, and by the way, it's not sex, it's not biological sex, it's gender role socialization. Cause we know in terms of, we've also looked at gender roles. 
Um, people who are raised as men feel more entitled to get their needs met. People who are raised as women are taught to be self-sacrificing. So especially women, um, androgynous women are, are not so different than men, but especially those of the more female gender role, they have more, we have more compassion for others and less compassion for ourselves. And it's my, I actually have, I wrote my last book, Fierce Self-Compassion was all about gender because I talked before about fierce and tender self-compassion. We don't have a lot of research on this, but this is what I've observed. Gender role socialization really messes us up here in terms of balance because boys, they're allowed to be fierce, but they aren't allowed to be tender. They're called names if they're too tender. Girls are allowed to be tender, well, toward others, not themselves. And if they get angry or they're too fierce, they're called different names. And so mm -hmm. basically, gender role socialization, not only does it keep us from being our authentic selves, it means we can't be whole. We can't balance this yin and yang. So in, in many ways, self-compassion is a radical act. It says, you know, I'm just going to be myself and I'm going to balance and I'm going to express both sides of myself, regardless of what society says, you know, says how I'm supposed to express it. So, yeah, that's where I was in my head right there. But regardless of how society expects me exactly. to, you know, and express and it. The, what a really strong finding is that it's linked to authenticity. When you aren't mm. so, when your self-worth isn't contingent contingent on other people liking you, you're free to be your true self, right? Great studies with transgender teens coming out, teaching self-compassion to transgender teens really helps um, these kids just, you know, love themselves exactly as they are and get, help them with strength and resilience because to deal with the awful bullying they often face, it was a really important resource for people to be their true authentic selves. That's great. That's so good to hear. And hopefully... Yeah. Uh, you know, more parents and organizations can get out there and start teaching that. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, next question from Kareem. In your book, you suggest self-compassion is the path to unlocking your higher potential and productivity. Can you describe how that works? What does the latest research show? Yeah, so absolutely. And there's, there's a lot of ways that it works. Some is just the, the emotional support when you have, when you know you have your own back and you feel more supported, you can take risks. But probably the, um, one of the most important mechanisms is by reducing fear of failure and, it, and increasing your ability to learn from your failure. So when, when you know it's okay to fail and it's not a problem failing and failing doesn't say anything about my worth as a person, then that means when you do fail, you can learn from it. You know, instead of saying, oh, I feel so horrible. It's like, hmm, I wonder why he got the contract. What did he do? Hmm, that's interesting. Instead of like, oh, I'm such a worthless failure, right? So, mm -hmm. so when you can learn and when you have this growth mindset, there's a lot of research that shows that growth mindset is directly linked to productivity. So just to give you an example, um, this study that my dissertation student just completed with athletes, these are like at UT Austin and all actually all over the country. So I'm um, tier one college athletes. She taught them self-compassion, especially how to deal with those moments of failure in sport, you know? So instead of beating themselves up, they were, they were kind of a, a good uh, supportive coach. She's the coaching metaphor to themselves instead of friends. She talked about a really good coach. What she found after teaching them self-compassion is their own performance and their, the coaches rated their performance is higher. You know, because if you blow it, I mean, if you blow it and then you just, if that derails you and then you're out of the game and you continue to go downhill, it's a negative spiral. But if you say, oh, okay, well, it happens. And you just keep going, you learn from that mistake, then you get, it's going to increase your productivity. So that's probably the key mechanism, I think, of why it increases productivity. Well, and lots of learnings for employers again in that space. Yeah. So that's really exciting. You know, when um, we say failure is the best teacher, it's true. <laughs> it's not well, truism, it's true. And I, be, I gotta be allowed to fail to learn. And I personally contribute a lot of my success also to having been able to like take feedback. Yeah. Maybe not I haven't labeled it as failure necessarily, but being able to right, take that yeah. that constructive yeah. feedback and actually translate it into into action. And um it, you know, definitely took a lot of learning for me to get to that place because I wasn't always able to do that so um, but watching my career kind of take off from that point so um, no I appreciate that and I appreciate the coaching metaphor that your dissertation yeah. student has been using yeah yeah for many people because you know a good coach doesn't just say like oh whatever that's fine 
they give you a lot of instruction. This is what you need to do and change. It's very mm -hmm. hands-on, but it comes from a good coach doesn't do it because they think you're worthless. You know, they do it because, hey, I believe in you. I have faith in you. I think you have potential. So it's coming from this place of care as opposed to a place of fear of inadequacy. It's a huge difference. Yeah. And an investment. Like we're giving an you investment. this feedback because we're investing in you. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I like that a lot. Um, do we have, I think we do have more questions. Maybe, maybe this was all the questions. Uh, one more. One more. All right. Wait. One more coming. All right. From Stephanie. When practicing self-compassion and setting boundaries, how can you help your loved ones understand the importance of this versus them getting offended? <laughs> right. So boundaries is really interesting. So I, I've been teaching fierce self-compassion workshops lately, and we do this exercise in setting boundaries. Um, so setting boundaries is, is complicated because you are involving other people. And uh, we can't control other people and their reactions to us. So you know, we can do our best to try to set the boundary in a way that they won't get offended, but we can't control it. So basically with, with setting boundaries, first of all, um, we need to validate our right to set boundaries and actually the necessity of it for our well-being. You know, really honoring the fact that if I just say yes to everyone all the time and don't set boundaries, I am harming myself. And ultimately that also harms my ability to help others. So I have the right to set boundaries. And then we need to balance the fierce and tenderness, right? So the fierce, the fierceness is the no, but instead of be, it being personal, the tenderness helps to see, it doesn't dehumanize everyone, anyone, sorry, anyone. So if you set a boundary in a way that makes the other person feel dehumanized or not cared about or not important, it's like, no, I don't care about you, then they're gonna be offended. But if you can somehow make them, you know, express it in a way that, yes, I, I, you're a human being, I care about, you, I wish I could help, but this is why it's really important to me and I'm sorry I can't. But in other words, with respect and making sure the other person still feels like a human being, then you increase the chances of them not being offended, but you can't control it. Because the truth is, and especially you know, from, a, from a feminist perspective, I mean, there's a reason why women are socialized to meet other people's needs, because that's the way we, like, we kind of, people have power over us. So you have to, at some point, be willing to say, you know, uh, even if you like me a little less, if I say no, it's more important that I like myself. Yeah. To, to, you know, for, to, to a point. On the other hand, you can't always say no because sometimes you want to keep your job. So you've got to also do what's best for you and use wisdom and all that. But really, that's one of the things self-compassion gives you. You become less dependent on other people's opinion of you and less invested in whether or not they are offended or mm -hmm. like you um, by your reaction to it. And you, you're more able to give an authentic answer. Um, but the more you remember that they're human beings, and say it in a way that acknowledges their humanity and doesn't um, make people feel cut off from you, that really helps. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I, like you said earlier, the freedom to be authentic. You know, yeah. I appreciate that. Um, so we actually have one more, one time for one more question. So okay. I thought it was before from Tony. Suffering feels strong when I think of my life situation, all the privilege and opportunity I've had or have and comparing to others worldwide historically with significant trauma and hardship. Yeah, and, and that's a good point. And also, um, if the word suffering feels too strong, then you don't have to use it. it. It's very natural for the human mind to immediately go into comparing mode. Like, how can I complain when, you know, there are people in Ukraine being bombed as we speak, right? Um, so if the word suffering is too strong, you can just use a discomfort or distress. So what you're doing is basically put it this way, yes, there are people right now in Ukraine um, experiencing a horrific war. But if I have some emotional upset and I say to myself, if I just like, I'm cold to myself or critical to myself or, or somehow really hard on myself because people in Ukraine are suffering a war, it's not gonna help the people there. What it's gonna do, it's gonna, it's gonna probably impair my ability to deal with my stuff which may actually, maybe I'm the type of person where if I were to get myself together, I can do something to help. 
you know, or get politically active or who knows what it is. In other words, um, everyone only has direct access to what's happening in our own consciousness at any one time. We can try to help others. And of course, this gives you more resources to help others. But if the contents of my consciousness are shame and blame and you know whatever, it's not helping anyone else's consciousness. This is all. This is the window that we have: our thoughts and feelings and emotions. And so, compassion is aimed at our thoughts and feelings and emotions, noticing when they're difficult or distressing, trying to um, help ourselves as best we can, trying to open our heart to ourselves, and then that kind of calmer, more stable, open-hearted mindset actually allows us to take in the suffering of others and hopefully do something about it as well. So turning it into action. Turning it into action, right. So, but, but if we belittle our own, so if we, if we make it a numbers game, then we'll never get anywhere because mm -hmm. you know there, there's always, almost always someone suffering more, right? So we got to start where we are, which is right here and then expand the circle. But if you don't like the word suffering, use stress or discomfort or something like that. Because some people imagine like big suffering. I'm just, I think so. if you stub your toe and you get so angry at it, you kick your dog, you know, because you stubbed your toe, well, then that you can see the negative chain that comes from if we don't acknowledge our suffering, even small suffering. So maybe there's a big S and a little S. Oh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I don't know. So. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time today. We have one last wrap up fun question for you. Okay. If there is one Google product you couldn't live without, what would it be? Oh gosh. Well, I use Google all the time. Um, well, uh, Google translate. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your work. And thank you um, for all that you do for the broader community and the world. Thank you. I appreciate that.